alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah walhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala khayri khalqillah. Nabiina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man ittaba al huda. Alhamdulillah. That Allah in his mercy has allowed us to gather today. We will begin today with the words of Allah Azza wa Jal. We would love to introduce a Sheikh Al Qari Abdul Majid Shahir. He studied the Quran with many different scholars and he has an ijazah, meaning he has a chain of narration in the Quran that goes back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which goes to Jibreel Alayhi Salam, which goes to Allah Azza wa Jal. So he has the ijazah in the, in the riwayah of Hafsan Asim, and we would love him to begin by reading from Allah's noble book, Tafaddal Ya Shaykh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. ترى أن الله أنزل من السماء ماء فأخرجنا به ثمرات مختلفا ألوانها ثمرات مختلفا ألوانها ومن الجبال جدد بيض حمر مختلف ألوانه ومن الناس والدواب والأنعام مختلف ألوانه كذلك إنما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء إن الله عزيز غفور إن الذين يتلون كتاب الله وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية يرجون تجارة لن تبور ليوفيهم أجورهم ويزيدهم من فضله إنه غفور شكور والذي أوحينا إليك من الكتاب هو الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه إن الله بعباده لخبير بصير ثم أورثنا الكتاب الذي نصطفينا من عبادنا فمنهم ظالم لنفسه ومنهم مقتصد ومنهم سابق بالخيرات بإذن الله ذلك هو الفضل الكبير جنات عدن يدخلونها يحلون فيها من أساور من ذهب ولؤلؤا ولباسهم فيها حرير وقالوا الحمد لله الذي أنهب عنا الحزن 
إن ربنا لغفور شكور الذي أحلنا دار المقامة من فضله لا يمسنا فيها نصب ولا يمسنا فيها لوب. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the Shaykh for reading these beautiful ayats. In the last ayat, it's talking about the believers when they go to Jannah. May Allah azza wa jal make all of us and our families from the people of Jannah and forgive our sins. Ameen. Up next, uh, we would love to introduce uh, uh, my friend and my sheikh and someone that we love very much uh, at the center, uh, which is our brother, uh, who is a graduate, mashallah, of uh, Medina University. Uh, he doesn't want me to say too much, but we love to welcome to the stage uh, Sheikh Yahya Sufi. Barakallahu feekum. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. أما بعد فسلام الله عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله today we are blessed to have one of our brothers Sheikh Abu Taymiyah الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى allowed him to come to Seattle and we're very excited to have you here in the city Sheikh is a graduate of Medina University الحمد لله that's where we met the Sheikh and what, that where we had a beautiful discussions and talks. I learned a lot from him. He looks young, but I, and he's young. I learned, I learned a lot from him. So that's what I graduated myself. Sheikh Edward himself also is a Madani student. Sheikh Abdullah Hashi also from Medina. So we all took from the same city, from the same university, from the same people. Alhamdulillah, I'm very, very happy to host him today in our city. Sheikh, it's all yours. الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين بعثه الله شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا First and foremost I want to take a moment out to thank the administration of the masjid this wonderful administration that is spearheaded by none other than our Sheikh Yahya Sufi حفظه الله تعالى I know he's sitting here acting extremely humble, but the reality is far than what you think. I remember the first time when we ran into one another, it was in one of the hotels in front of the haram. Wallahi, I still remember it like it was, it was yesterday. It was myself, Sheikh Abdul Zakh al-Khalafi, Sheikh Abdullah Bihi, and the Sheikh was sitting there and he was giving us a reminder about the importance of unity. I remember at the time, this is back in 2015, the Shaykh, he quoted maybe 10 verses from the top of his head while he also mentioned the ayah number, the verse number of every single one of them from the top of his head, which, le which left me absolutely astonished. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase him in khair. Right? So you, my brothers and my sisters, honestly have people of knowledge amongst you that you may not necessarily benefit from simply because they don't have a presence online. You have the likes of Sheikh Yahya Sufi, also a Sheikh Abdullah Hashi, who is a graduate from Kulit al Hadith. Alongside them, you have our brother, Sheikh Abdullah Shire, who was one of the locals of the masjid, who studied in Egypt. When I first arrived in Egypt a couple of years ago, he really, really looked after me. He found me an apartment, really helped me settle in. And ever since, he's always been telling me, if you come to America, you have to come to Seattle. And Alhamdulillah, we managed to get together in this institution, Mayf Islamic Center, to revise the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a big thanks to every single one of them who put blood, sweat, and tears into putting this program together. Secondly, my brothers and my elders who have attended, I want to thank all of the attendees, all of these glowing young faces who took time out of their Saturday to sit here to benefit. You could have been doing 101 things on a Saturday evening. We know what many of the shabab, many of the youngsters are up to 
on a Saturday evening, but you chose to sit here, brothers. And that's something that should be commended. We always bash the youth and youngsters for doing the wrong thing. So when they do something right, it's something that should be pointed out. Just think about it for a moment. How many friends do we have that are maybe sitting at home today playing FIFA? You guys play soccer online, right? You don't play it on the ground. You play NFL, football, and basketball. But on the computer or on the TV, you play FIFA, right? They're doing all sorts of things, wasting their time. Maybe getting together, planning what they are going to be carrying out tonight. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man yuridillahu bi khayran yufaqihu fi deen. Whoever Allah wants good for, He gives him understanding in the religion. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted good for you. He handpicked you out of all of these different shabab that may well be doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tonight. But you are sitting here. And that's something that you should really be grateful for. The fact that He chose you from amongst all of these people, guys. Well, I say this from the bottom of my heart. The fact that you came... It really shows that there is goodness in your heart. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you firm. My beloved brothers and elders, in today's session, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, I want to speak a little bit about the identity of a Muslim. In a time and age, when we have normative Islam that's under attack, wherever you go, wherever you look, Whenever you surf the world wide web, one way or the other, you see that which is most precious to every single one of us and that's none other than Al-Islam. They are trying their utmost best to strip faith away from every single one of us. If you look at some of the great companions of the past, those names that come to mind are the likes of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, right? The four great caliphates. However, these four great caliphates, they were not from the top five of the companions who narrated the most a hadith. Did you know that my brothers and my elders, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, they weren't from the top five that narrated the most a hadith. There were those who narrated more than them, who had the pens and the papers, writing down the knowledge, taking it in, and then conveying it to those around them. From amongst them are the likes of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then second in line, my brothers and my sisters, is the son of the great caliphate Umar ibn Khattab. His name is Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Suyuti mentions in his Al-Fiyah wal Mukthiruna fi riwayat al-Athar Abu Hurayrat yali ibn Umar Abdullah ibn Umar was second in line Why am I mentioning all of this my brothers and my elders We don't want to make it technical In the lecture that I'm delivering Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma Whenever he went for Umrah After finishing the tawaf around the Kaaba He would go and stand at Safa We've heard of Safa and Marwa, right? After we finish accumulating the Kaaba, we go to the Mas'a, where we run from Safa to Marwa and then back again. It is from the places where your dua gets accepted. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. With all the different options that he has, all the different duas that he could make, he would stand at Safa and you know what he would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and elders? He would say, Allahumma innaka khult. Ud'uni astajib lakum. Oh Allah, indeed you said. Call on to me and I will respond to you. I will respond to your du'as. Fa'innaka la tukhrifu al-mi'ad. And indeed, ya Allah, you do not break your promise. Allahumma inni as'aluk. Kama hadaytani ila al-islami. An la tanzi'ahu minni. Oh Allah, I ask you, just as you guided me to Al-Islam, Ya Allah, do not strip Islam away from me. This is the companion, my brothers and my elders, 
who was second in line out of all of the companions that narrated a hadith. He had the knowledge and he was spreading it. He's begging Allah, Ya Allah, just as you guided me to Al-Islam, Ya Allah, do not strip faith away from me. And then he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa anta tawaffani wa ana muslima. And when you take my soul, allow me to die as a Muslim. They didn't have all of these isms that we see so rampant in today's day and age. You walk into these, into these universities, my brothers and my elders, they are breeding grounds for kufr, shirk, fahisha, all of these different isms, liberalism, feminism, secularism, and of course the rainbow team as well, right? It's a breeding ground for that. One's religion, my brothers and my sisters and my elders, is on the line. When I went to university, I was doing civil engineering. One of the things that I witnessed, my brothers and my elders, is people like me and you, like me and you, who would learn Al Islam, so that they could be guided. No, not that they could be guided but so that they could target vulnerable Muslims who are on the fringes of their religion. They would go chasing after them in and around campus, posing questions to them so that their faith may be shaken to the core. And then that Muslim, my brothers and my sisters and my elders, is shaken. He doesn't have the answers. And then you see him, subhanAllah, tripping over simply because he doesn't have a response. This is what I witnessed, guys, and I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to this. Learning our religion, our religion, just so they could use it against Muslims. My beloved brothers and sisters and elders and those who are listening online, there is a hadith that scares the living daylight out of me whenever I come past it. It is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, بَادِرُوا بِالْعَمَالِ فِتَنًا كَقِطْعِ اللَّيْلِ الْمُظْرِمِ Hasten to doing good deeds. The fitan, the trials and tribulations, the corruptions that you will see unfolding right before your eyes are like the dark patches of the night. Now imagine yourself in the middle of a forest. There is no torch. There is nothing to guide you out of this dark forest. What will happen to those who are stuck? You will see them tripping over left, right and center. Not knowing how to navigate and maneuver around all of these different obstacles. You will see them not having a good time, brothers and sisters. Here the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam likens the fitan, the trials and the tribulations that come your way, the corruptions you see unfolding right before your eyes, like one stuck in a forest on a deep, dark night. Yusbihul insanu mu'minan wa yumsi kafira. When he wakes up in the morning, brothers and my sisters, and then by the night he has disbelieved. He has disbelieved, brothers. He has lost his faith, that which is most precious to him. And that is what Al-Islam, he's lost it. From being someone who adheres to the religion. His name is Muhammad. By the night, brothers, he wants to rid himself of this identity that he was beautified with all of these years. Muhammad has lost his Islamic identity by the night. Even though when he woke up that morning, he was someone who was believing in Allah. And it may well be that he enters into the night and he is a believer, brothers. And then by the morning he has disbelieved. You know, subhanAllah, maybe approximately 10 years ago, when I was studying in a village, in the middle of nowhere, in the northern part of Yemen, I came across this hadith and it really didn't make sense to me. 
How is it that an individual, he enters into the night as a believer and then by the morning, he has lost his faith. Because normally people tend to get ready in the evening to go to sleep in order to rest, right? But then subhanAllah by the morning has disbelieved. Up until the era of social media, right? It began to fall into place. When I was preparing for my master's entry exam on Aqeedah, I was reading a lot of different books. I came across a lot of statements, but one statement that really, really stood out to me was when one of the professors of the university said in his book, and his name is Sheikh Abdul Qadir Ata Sufi, there's no relationship between the Sheikh and him. Huh? His name is Sheikh Abdul Qadir Ata. He is one of the great professors of the Jamia, of the university. He said, and this really, really touched me. Once upon a time, we would tell the professors when a student comes from maybe Somalia or from Pakistan, right, or Indonesia, do not expose to these students certain types of ideologies, sentiments, and doubts that they might never ever come across. The doubts that they might be exposed to in their countries back home are very limited. We, because of the books that we read as professors and the different students that we engage with, we come to learn about a whole lot of doubts and sentiments and ideologies that this student from Somalia might never ever come across. So don't start exposing them to something that would probably never cross their mind. Up until when the whole world became like a small little village. The whole world today, brothers, would you agree, has become like a small little village with the emergence of social media. Where just about every type of doubt, every filthy sentiment is a fingertip away. We go to these universities as someone who is adhering to Al-Islam. And do what the students have been exposed to. We come home with our minds polluted. You know what really breaks my heart, my brothers and my sisters? And I'm telling you, brothers, because we all have sisters. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to have children, perhaps maybe daughters, that we will be taking to these breeding grounds of kufr, shirk, fahisha, and every evil you can think of. A sister, she's dressed up modestly from top to bottom, adhering to her Islamic values. When she walks into university, she doesn't take off a hijab. I know that happens. People do take off the hijabs. But this sister, she holds on to a hijab. And she runs into sisters who look no different to her. And these sisters, my beloved brothers and sisters and elders, are carrying sentiments that is borderline Islam. For example, now feminism. We look at some of these isms and think it's not a big deal. But when someone hears about a hijabi sister becoming impregnated when going to university is a big deal. That's a major sin, guys. However, certain sentiments that are spewed by these feminists can take an individual out the fold of Islam. Some of them are flirting with disbelief, flirting with kufr. She is exposed to all types of evil. And then you see her all of a sudden out of the blue contesting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. Because she's been made to believe, she's been convinced that she should look at everything with the lens of equal rights. Now let me ask you, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down his message to establish justice or to establish equal rights? He sent down his, mes his message to establish justice. There's a big difference between the two. So she comes along with all of these sentiments that she's embraced and she starts contesting verses in the Quran. This is not fair. This is unjust. 
when Allah said about himself, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not oppress anyone. Now think about that for a moment, which one's worse? Someone carrying out the major sin of fahisha outside of marriage or contesting what Allah has mentioned in the Quran, speaking to Allah Azza wa in a boisterous manner. And then she comes to us and she says, what does Islam say about abortion? What does Islam say about the woman? What does Islam say about this? What does Islam say about that? Don't ask me what does Islam say because that sounds like Islam has become like a human being. Ask me what Allah said. Can you see how the dynamics change? When you ask what did Allah say instead of asking me what does Islam say about this? Ask me what does Allah say about this particular point? Even in your heart, it comes across differently my brothers and my sisters. This is what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, my brothers and my sisters. And it really, really breaks the heart. A big cause of it, my brothers and my sisters, is what we are currently being exposed to on the world wide web. For those who didn't know what www stands for, it stands for the world wide web. Let that resonate for a moment. The whole world is a fingertip away. And our hearts are being exposed to it. Some of us were sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. Oh, that child became an atheist, man. Subhanallah. We feel bad about it, right? We sit around feeling sorry for ourselves. And we feel hopeless. We can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. And I will explain. The time, my brothers and my sisters, of feeling sorry for yourselves has to end today. Children are walking out of universities all of a sudden, right? Doubting which pronoun to use next. Confused. They come home, Dad, I think it's time to change my pronoun. The parent gets angry. He becomes upset, right? He might even beat the living daylight out of him. And we've heard and been informed of qisas like this. Not qisas, qasas. There's a difference between the two. That's the reality of a matter. Right? Real life incidents that we have to deal with on a week to week basis, guys. I never thought that time would come. But at the same time, I'm telling myself the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us 14 years ago that which I feared the most for every single one of you. That which I feared the most for my Ummah is the practice of the people of Lot. Before I commence, I just want to point out, just in case, we have someone sitting here that works for Fox News, right? I am not here to incite violence or harassment towards anybody. Just in case someone here wants to misconstrue and take out of context what I'm saying. No, brothers and sisters, Abu Taymiyyah does not have views and opinions. I'm just here quoting and relating back the reality on the ground. I'm not here to express anything that I believe. Moving on swiftly, my brothers and my sisters, the child comes home, polluted, confused about his identity, and then the father starts beating the di li living daylight out of him. And he might even call the sheikh and say, Jini ya kujira. He's got jini in him. No, he doesn't have jini on him. Right? He's simply just confused. He's been taken to this breeding ground, and I'm going to keep saying this. It is a breeding ground. Children as young as four are now being exposed, right? To that which we thought was absolutely unimaginable. This is what they're being exposed to. And then we as parents might get angry. Why are we getting angry? We are the ones that took them there, right? From the moment they wake up, all we speak about is their mustaqbal, their futures, right? That is the number one priority. In the eyes of many of us today. You guys want to know what's really, really shocking? Recently, a, a brother contacted me. And he said, his sister has become an atheist. However, the mother is telling them, don't open a dialogue pertaining to her apostasy. Why? Because they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to distract her from her studies. This is... 
This is, my brothers and my sisters, the main focus of many today. She's just lost her religion, but the parent is saying, nah, man, huh? Nah. Let her just continue with her secular university studies. We don't want to, you know, distract her. What if she dies tomorrow? What on earth is that university degree going to benefit our sister with, brothers and sisters? Right? The reality of the matter is, my brothers and my sisters, whatever your direction you are in, it's an ideological war against that which is most precious to every single one of us. If you don't do anything about it today, don't be shocked and surprised when the next generation of Muslims are waking up in the morning and saying, Dad, and his name is Muhammad, right? I want to marry Mark. Don't be surprised. I've been saying this everywhere. Do not be surprised. And you know what it boils down to? Lack of Islamic education. Lack of Islamic education. There's a very, very powerful statement of both Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziya and Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi. He says, إِذَا ضَعُفَتِ السُنَّةِ قَوِيَةِ الْبِدْعَةِ When the sunnah becomes weak, you find, you find that the bid'ah, which is the opposite, the innovations, they start taking a stronghold. And that's with everything, brothers. When you have one extreme, and it is not dealt with accordingly, the haqq is not propagated, you will see the opposite extreme also taking a stronghold. Just look at feminism for a moment. Feminism that scared the living daylight of men, right? Men, a lot of them have become simps today because of this movement of how the women, right? They propagate whatever they stand for. A man is too scared of being canceled. Just being a man now, huh? just being a man, he's become terrified of it. To make it even more specific, he doesn't even know what the manly characteristics are. He no longer knows how a man should be simply because of this cancellation culture. Right? That was on the ground, taking a stronghold for such a long time. Now you have, as a knee-jerk reaction, the Red Pill movement. Again, the Red Pill movement has many sentiments that does not fall in line with the Islam. But are we surprised are we surprised, my brothers and my sisters? And this is from the beginning of time. When you have a type of innovation, you will see the opposite. Irja, khawarijism, and so on and so forth. You will always find that. Right? So now, my brothers and my sisters, you're asking yourself, how is all of this becoming so widespread? All of these different isms. And we're sitting around feeling sorry for ourselves. Let me draw an example, my brothers and my sisters, of the rainbow team. And again, I'm not here to incite violence or harassment. It's unfortunate that I have to use this as an example so that we can take inspiration from it. The rainbow team, my brothers and my sisters and my elders, they have the loudest voice on social media. Agreed? Am I exaggerating here, guys? They have the loudest voice on social media. Even though compared to everybody else, they are like what? A raindrop in an ocean. Sahih? You walk into universities, right? Whenever they want to acquire certain rights, you bet they are going to get their rights. Sahih? It is being shoved down our throats, rubbed down our faces. You can't say a single thing. Unfortunately, right? You know why, brothers and sisters? You know why my elders, they are the loudest and they come across as if they are the majority, I'll tell you guys, because they are all playing an active role in propagating that which they stand for. They are all playing an active role in propagating that which they stand for, my brothers and my sisters. Right? You click on one of these hashtags, don't click on it, in fact. Huh? But if you, you guys know what I'm talking about, you accidentally click on one of these hashtags on Twitter, those colorful ones, huh? And then you come across that which absolutely blows your mind. You think to yourself, subhanAllah, they're so huge in number. But that's not the case, guys. That's not a reality. 
You got maybe one guy here, another two guys in a different city, a third guy across the other side of the world or across the pond. Huh? You have all of these different people in different localities, but there are only a few. But on the World Wide Web, they come across, subhanAllah, so huge in number. And that is because they are utilizing and taking advantage of this very powerful tool of social media. And then subhanAllah, a Muslim who's on the fringes of his religion, he sees this and he says, wow man, you know, it may well be natural, right? It may well be a reality, right? Let me give them a chance and hear out what they're about to say. And then because his heart is so weak, he doesn't have the tools, right? To equip himself accordingly so that he's able to repel the shubah, which is a khattafa. Huh? The shubah, the doubts, that, is, well, that will snatch your heart away. Doesn't. Huh? I'm sure some of you guys came across the video on the Jubilee YouTube channel, right? Where you had conservative Muslims and you had liberal Muslims. Right? This is how they categorize them. These two brothers, alhamdulillah, may Allah bless them. They really, really held it down. I reached out to them after I watched the video. Right? And they said they actually watched one of my videos before they went on there. Alhamdulillah. And they had the answers, they had the tools to repel some of the doubts that were being pushed by those who ascribe themselves to Al-Islam. <coughs> Allahu Akbar. But subhanAllah, you listen to some of the things they were saying, right? It shocks you. It shocks you, subhanAllah, how normative Islam has diminished in the worlds of many. Right? So, my brothers and my sisters, the point in what I'm trying to say is that we have to be actively involved. My message that I have for the people in America is now or never. It is either now or never. Otherwise, do not be shocked tomorrow. In the UK, we're a lot more conservative. The reaction over there in the UK, when certain things start emerging, was very different to here in America. And of course, I know there are reasons, there are asbab, and the people of America, they know that better. But it is scary, my brothers and my sisters, holding on to your religion as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, لا يأتي على الناس زمان القابض على دينه كالقابض على الجمر. While holding on to your religion, is like holding on to hot coal, right? We are living in these times. And the only thing that is going to save every single one of us, my brothers and my sisters, is none other than beneficial knowledge, right? You got the multi-billionaires, the likes of Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, huh? They refer to knowledge as power. Yes, it is powerful. It is extremely, extremely powerful, right? of how you could easily convince someone from being on the verge of disbelief to holding on to his religion and being firm upon it, that is powerful, brothers and sisters. And that is through the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down. What we need to understand, my brothers and my sisters, that the shaitan has been and remains to be upon that mission that he swore to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he would accomplish and execute Two things that he's trying to change. Number one, your outer appearance. The moment he's able to change your outer appearance, changing your fitrah, your natural disposition, that, you, that which you were brought into existence with, will also follow suit. What do we mean by that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, Quoting the devil, Rabbi bima aghwaytani la'aqudanna lahum siratak al mustaqim. The shaitan, he swears, the iblis, the devil. Just as you expelled me from al Jannah, you destroyed me, I am going to sit in between them and also the right path. You know the right path that we beg Allah Azza wa Jal every raka'ah to keep us, to keep us firm upon? Ihdina sirat al mustaqim, right? That's what we say all the time. He said, I'm going to sit in between them and also the right path. I'm going to sit in between them. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes them to have said, ثُمَّ لَآتِيَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ He's going to come from four directions. The first direction I was mentioned from the front. The shaytan is going to come from the front. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, this means, أُشَكِّكُهُمْ فِي أَخِرَتِهِمْ I'm going to give them doubts about the hereafter. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ I'm also going to come to them from the back. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He said, أُرَغِّبُهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا I'm going to cause them to love the dunya. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ He's also going to come from the right. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He said, أُشَبِّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَمْرَ دِينِهِمْ I'm going to give them doubts about their religion. وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ I'm also going to come from the left. الْحَسْنُ الْبَصْرِ رَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ رَحْمَةٌ وَاسِعَةٌ He said, السَّيِّئَاتُ يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِهَا وَيُزَيِّنُهَا فِي عَيُنِهِمْ السَّيِّئَاتُ يَأْمُرُهُمْ بِهَا وَيَحُثُّهُمْ عَلَيْهَا You know the evil deeds? He's going to encourage you now to engage in it. He's going to beautify it in their eyes. Shaitan, my brothers and my sisters, is not going to say to you, this is haram, go and do it. He's not going to say that. He's going to try and beautify it in your eyes. Right? Baby steps towards it. And these sins that we carry out, my brothers and my sisters, you will see it having effect on an individual's fitr, on an individual's natural disposition. Right? Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says, Al-ma'siyatu baridu al-kufur. The sin that one takes maybe lightly, right? It is the first spark to kufur, the first spark to disbelief. One thing leads to another. So as I mentioned, my brothers and my sisters, right? There's two things that he's trying to change. Number one, your outer appearance, and then also your fitrah. And they are two that go hand in hand with one another. And I will explain this. Allah even, subhanAllah, you know, he quoted the devil. Right. He said, Sometimes, you know, people ask, Can I wear this? Is it okay? Right? Resembling a group of people. How does that impact an individual's belief? I will explain, inshaAllah ta'ala. Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi in his kitab Iqtida al-Salat al-Mustaqim he talks about it. He says that the sharakat in the hadiyah al-Zahir turithu tanasuban wa tashakula resembling a group of people from the outside it leads one to blend in to have a sense of belonging towards a group of people. Right? And that is the moment we start resembling them from the outside. And then he gives the example of a young child that you dress up as a soldier. Let me ask you all a question. When you dress up a young child as a soldier, what's the first thing he's going to start doing? Who can tell me? You dress him up like a soldier. What's the first thing he's going to do? Huh? He's going to kill me? He's going to start acting like a soldier, right? He's going to take the gun and he's going to start Second Amendment, huh? Second Amendment. He's going to start what? Behaving like a soldier. He'll pick up that toy gun and start shooting at people. The moment you dress him a certain way, right? He starts behaving like that which now he looks like. Ibn Taymiyyah then draws the point. When an individual now begins to dress a certain way. Like sometimes we dress like these rappers. Huh? We dress like these rappers that we keep on watching. Wallahi alladhi la ilaha ghayra. A root cause, a root cause of one becoming a drug dealer is watching some of these rappers that are glorifying haram. Agreed? Wallala. Without a shadow of a doubt. Right? When you constantly see someone glorifying filth and evil, 
whether you believe it or not, you will see it subconsciously creeping in. He ends up becoming a drug dealer. This is after he started imitating him from the outside. Right? You got some of my brothers and my sisters. They got rainbow hair. Rainbow teeth, guys. Who's he imitating? That guy called 6 9 Right? 6 9 people want to dress like him and then you see them behaving like that. Imagine now, Hadko Ugerti. Rainbow hair, rainbow teeth, guys. Dresses like him. You see them glorifying all types of evil. Behaves like them. And then you see him becoming no different to them. And a lot of these guys, when they rap, they're actually rapping of something that they would never do anyway. A lot of the time. And then my brothers and my sisters, you know what the sad thing in all of this is? Eventually, you know what it leads to? Believing that which they believe. Your aqidah now ends up changing. Can you see how the shaitan has accomplished in that which he went out to do? Which is to change two things. Your outer appearance and then also what? Your fitrah. What did it all start with? Your outer appearance. And the people you hang around with and that which you keep looking at. And this is very, very important. Right? This is very, very important. You know, we grew up, Ab and Hoya telling us, Ya Muhammad, Abdullahi, don't hang around with that drug dealer. Sahih? If you hang around with that drug dealer, we grew up. Are you guys surprised my Somali? Huh? I'm learning Somali, guys. In Leicester, where I'm from, there's a lot of Somali people. I'm becoming better. What are you, Sheikh? If you have any comment on it, Sheikh, tfaddal. We grew up like that. Our parents telling us, stay away from so and so. Don't hang around with him. Sahih? Because he will leave a bad influence on you. And then the hadith of the blacksmith and the perfume seller would be quoted. Until the end of the hadith. All these are hadith that we've grown up hearing. You're upon the religion of your friends, so be careful who you take as friends. Right? Once upon a time, a parent would say, Huh? Alhamdulillah. Will Kega, Gabrateda. My child is at home. He's not hanging around with the wrong people. Right? They're just at home. Everything, Alhamdulillah, is great. The days when we thought, the days when we thought that one would become corrupted. And that's the only way it gets corrupted, right? By hanging around with the wrong people, these days are long gone. You can wave goodbye. Somebody may be at home on his phone all day long. All day long he's on his phone and he's watching these rap R&B videos. Right? He's just looking at it. Staring at it on a day-to-day -day basis, guys. I'll tell you guys something that an auntie said to me. She called, she was like, Speak to my daughter. I was like, what's the issue? She's asking me to wear a miniskirt. Miniskirt, you guys know what a miniskirt is, right? She, the 13 or 14 year old, wants to wear a miniskirt. The mother is saying, I've never worn a miniskirt. Her sisters have never worn a miniskirt. Why is she asking me to wear a miniskirt? I'll tell you guys what it is. Because she's watching these fasiqat and these fajirat in kafirat. On TikTok every day, she's watching all these girls eh, who are, you know, shaking themselves, behaving a certain way. This young child grows up watching her. And then she says, mom, can you buy me a miniskirt? And then the mom's confused. Right? She goes, what do you mean? Naya. Huh? Her response then is, what do you mean, mom? What's the issue? What's the issue? What have I done wrong? She doesn't know because that's all she sees. She became desensitized to it. And the same, my brothers, goes with these young men who are watching these rappers from the morning till the evening. And then you see him dragging his trousers, right? Even his posture changes. Not realizing that he's changed because of what he keeps looking at. What you keep looking at goes a very long way in how you start behaving. You know the Salaf of the past, the righteous of the past, they would say, don't look at the lazy person. Let me ask you guys a question. Looking at a lazy person is a haram. If you see a guy who's a bum sitting at home and you look at him, huh? you're staring at him. Are you falling into sin? 
Huh, guys? Is it haram? No, it's not. It's not haram to look at somebody who's lazy. But why would they say don't look at him? Because subconsciously it creeps in and then it ends up affecting the way you think and the way you behave. Right? Even subhanAllah, the scholars of the past would say, so and so when you look at him, you just look at him, he reminds you of Allah. They would make dua, Ya Allah, make us from those that when you look at him, right, people remember Allah. He hasn't opened his mouth. He just looked at him. He remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah Azza make us all like them. Right? By just look at him, you remember Allah. Right? So they would go out their way, they might be down, their morale may have, you know, reduced. Let's go and look for the righteous so that my iman goes, just look at him. Reminds you of Allah Azza wa And then they would take gems and pearls from what he utters. Right? So what you look at goes a very, very long way. So we got people always asking us, I'm completely unrecognizable. I've lost my identity. My friends can no longer recognize me. A lot of the time, brothers and sisters, it starts with an innocent look. And then it becomes an intriguing look. And then you keep looking at it till it becomes a part of you. You start behaving like that. Right? After you began to dress like them, and eventually you end up believing what they believe. And then you're what? Completely unrecognizable. Right? Nobody can identify you anymore from what you was before. So the eyes go very, a very, very long way, my brothers and my sisters. Right? So your identity, my brothers and my sisters, now you have an idea of how it becomes distorted, how it begins to change. I'm going to give you guys five things, inshallah ta'ala, to hold on to. Some of you guys may have heard me say it before, with little reels going around, but these five things, inshallah ta'ala, that as long as you hold on to it, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, you'll be steadfast. Very, very quickly, my brothers and my sisters, number one, if you missed the whole lecture, you just walked in now, right? Take away at least these five things. And then you can watch it later, inshallah ta'ala, online. Number one, my brothers and my sisters, I don't care what is happening in your lives. I don't care if you've become the biggest drug dealer. I don't care if this sister is selling herself online, right? You're engaging in the worst possible sin. Do not leave off the prayer. Do not leave off the salah, no matter what is happening in your life, my brothers and my sisters. Sometimes the shaitan whispers and he says, how can you pray when you just walked out of the club or you just done this haram? Of course, it's a bad thing to do these evil sins, right? But, but, the salah is there as Allah tells us. Inna salah anil wal munkar. The salah, it removes the filth and the evil from your life. Don't leave of the salah. The moment you leave of the salah, expect your whole life to come crumbling down into the ground. The salah is what holds you together, brothers. And it's only a matter of time before you begin to feel uncomfortable in that evil environment that you're in. Are you brothers and uncles and elders with me? Don't leave it off. Right? Some of you guys may have seen that viral video going around of me speaking about my friend who was a drug dealer. The man's moving drugs from A to B. He stops his car when the time of salah kicks in, takes out his sajada, his prayer mat, and he starts praying. Three of his non-Muslim friends became Muslim. They were like, this guy's onto something, huh? He never gets arrested, let's become Muslim as well. The man's moving drugs from A to B, he wouldn't leave his salah. Now he has flipped his life around. I put it down to not leaving off the prayer. Number two, my brothers and my sisters, I have another six minutes. Number two. Have a relationship with the house of Allah. Five daily prayers, try to pray in the masjid. You can't pray in the masjid. Four. Can't do four, three. Two. You can't do two, do one. Right? And if there was one prayer that if one had to choose, I would say to him the Fajr prayer. Inside the house of Allah. You want the perfect morning? Be someone who starts his day early. Today they talk a lot about the high value man, right? The high value man. And they say from the trace of the high value man is that he wakes up early. Sahih. Instead of what? Waking up 
at 12 p.m. Huh? The guy was awake all night and then he's asleep all day. The perfect morning is to wake up, my brothers. If you can, even better, a couple of minutes before the Fajr prayer, before the Adhan goes off to pray the night prayer. And then to make dua in your sujood. Right? It's the dua that doesn't miss its target. It's a very special part of the night where Allah comes down. Yanzilu Rabbuna tabarak wa ta'ala. Kulla laylatin ila samayi dunya. You know, I read Jeff Bezos saying that he normally wakes up very, very early because he feels some sort of huh, spiritual, you know, empowerment when he wakes up early. I'm like, duh, that's when Allah comes down, right? It's the last third of the night. All of these multi-billionaires, they wake up early, right? You have some of the non-Muslims, my brothers and my sisters, that wake up 5 a.m. in the morning to take his kelp, Aegis, the dog, for a walk. He wakes up for his dog. But we can't wake up for Allah. Right? Can't wake up for Allah. To go and pray in the masjid. Right? And to make your morning even better, up until sunrise, you read Quran. That is the perfect morning, my brothers. You want to feel good? Right? You feel spiritually dead? Try that. Are you brothers and sisters with me? You know, I come to this message, my brothers and my sisters, and I'm absolutely taken aback. I'm amazed, brothers. We don't have things like this in the UK. A message with a sports hall? We're currently sitting in a sports hall, guys. Right? It's part of the masjid. Our Sheikh has done an amazing job to have a masjid alongside a social space for somebody to come and vibe at. We're sitting here in a sports hall where you study and you learn at the same time. Come and play, right? Wallahi, this is the spot. Maybe if, if I would move to America, which I don't think would happen, I'd move to uh, Allahumma Barak, yani. right? Keeping a connection with the house of Allah. And you have, my brothers and my sisters, no excuse. Especially with everything that you see, subhanAllah, yani. you, got, you got hoops inside of the masjid, the masjid building. Again, brothers, I don't care what you've done. You just walked out of the club, feel comfortable to walk into the masjid. Nobody should be made to feel uncomfortable walking into the house of Allah. Last time I checked, it says Baytullah. The house huh, of Muhammad or of Fatima or of the elderly who sits in the front. No, it is the house of Allah where everybody is welcome. And wallahi, this looks like a very, very welcoming masjid. Just look around you. Right? And even the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيَّةِ الْحَسَنَةِ تَمْحَا Follow up the bad deed with the good. Right? Shaykh Wasallam Taymi says, مِنَ الْجِنْسِ مِنْ نَفْسِ الْجِنْسِ Meaning that if you walk into somewhere that is haram, and then you're regretful for doing so, walk into somewhere that is pleasing to Allah, and that is the masjid. You walked into the club to repent, to erase that bad deed, walk into the masjid. Does that make sense? Keep a relationship with the house of Allah. It's one of those things that really increase your iman. Number three, guys, Toba. My brothers and my sisters, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will seek forgiveness. How many times in a sitting? Who can tell me? 70. In some narrations, 100. This is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who didn't have any past or future sins, right? He didn't have any past or future sins. Now compare that to the sexualized society that we live in, where women are objectified. You see a toothbrush being sold or a toothpaste being advertised on a billboard and right alongside that you find a half naked woman. What on earth does a half naked woman got to do with a toothbrush? Now you tell me. Because they realize the way you grab the attention of the consumer is by using a half-naked woman. You walk into these universities, everything is inviting you to haram. Hey, Telek, come. Let's get it on. You find that everywhere. And every time we look at something, brothers, it's putting that black dot on our hearts. Right? It kills our hearts. We begin to feel, right, that sense of emptiness because of what we keep on looking at. So we are constantly in need of seeking forgiveness. 
I'll give you guys something that will maybe help to pawn addiction. Becoming addicted to adult content. Every time you fall into that addiction, get up, make wudu, and then pray to rakat in private. Follow up that private sin with a deed that is also private. And the Messenger told us, whenever an individual now commits a sin, stands up to make wudu, and then prays to rakat, his sin will be forgiven. I know you're going to be remorseful and regretful for doing that sin, even if it happens a thousand times. As Imam al Nawi said, come back and repent again. And it's only a matter of time. Also, pick up that pen and paper tonight. This is something practical, guys. You're tired of falling into that sin and tired of repenting. Get that pen and paper and write down. Identify the problem. It's one thing identifying the problem, it's another finding the solution. What is it that is causing me constantly to run back into that sin or to fall back in it? What is it that's causing me that all the time? All right, you write it down. Am I constantly falling into adult content maybe through Instagram? Is that maybe the cause? I delete it. Is it maybe because I keep accessing a certain website, I either block it and if I can't, I get rid of that phone for a set period of time. The psychologists, they say, if you want to get rid of a certain habit, you need 20 days, right? It may well be time, my brothers and my sisters, that we get rid of these smartphones, especially now with the month of Ramadan around the corner, right? And we buy one of these trap phones. You know the brick phone that you used to have back in the day? We'll play snake on it. Huh? It might be time to have that before the month of Ramadan. 20 days, give it 20 days, guys. Huh? We need a detox. Somebody who's addicted to drugs, they take him to, what do they call it? Rehab, sah. We are in need of rehab because we've become addicts. If you want to test yourself, leave your phone at home and then walk out. See if you don't start behaving and reacting like a nitty, like an addict. See whether that happens or not. It's a sign to know that you're an addict. Right? Wallahi, I gave a lecture in a masjid. And this is what I advised the brother. And he kept on bombarding me. I'm an addict to adult content. I told him, get rid of your phone. A couple of months, I went back to that masjid and I gave a lecture. Right? And he comes running behind me after the lecture. And he says, look. Wallah, he had the brick phone on him. He had the trap phone on him, guys. And he goes, ever since I bought it, I never went back to that sin. Try it. We can live without it, brothers. Stop telling me that TikTok and Instagram has become from the essentials of life. We've convinced ourselves that's the case. Number four. Read a bit of Quran every day, guys. Read a bit of Quran every day. It's one of those things that really increases your iman. A little bit every day and you'll see yourself increasing. And last but not least, my brothers and my sisters, a lot of these isms, these doubts that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and a lot of the temptations that we face, that which will help us maneuver and navigate around it is none other than beneficial knowledge. We have to be actively seeking knowledge. Otherwise, don't be surprised, like I said before, that your child wakes up one day and he's carrying a Christmas tree into the house. Don't be surprised. We have to start educating them from now. And the only way you can do that is by educating yourself. Tomorrow you're going to get married. Everybody here wants to get married. Unless there's something wrong with you. Huh? Everybody here wants to get married. And then he wants to have children. Sahih. That children are a manner. If you don't know, and your wife doesn't know, and this is why you got to pick the right one, who do you expect to guide your children, guys? You guys have mashayikh in and around you. Right? Sheikh Yahya, he acts like we are equals or we come from the same university, right? And that we studied with the same Mashayikh. I think when he started the university, I was still being chased by a helicopter in London, right? But he's acting all humble and everything. Wallahi al azim guys. He told me he started university at a time, right? When the helicopter was chasing me in London. Don't ask me why, right? He's a lot more senior, right? He has the knowledge to help every single one of you guys. You have Sheikh Abdullah Hashi, another graduate. You have Sheikh Abdullah Shira, who spent a lot of time in Egypt. Benefit from these brothers. 
A lot of people think that you only seek knowledge if you want to become a star or if you want to become the next big sheikh. No guys, you cannot function in this world without knowledge. Just ask all of these YouTubers who have everything. Cars, women. I'll get more specific. Logan Paul, KSI, Justin Bieber, Fusi Tube. All of them are extremely, extremely filthy rich. But what they also have in common is that they are depressed. They are empty. They themselves will say, what you see on camera is very different to what happens behind closed doors. Wallahi, I heard them saying this and I sent the videos to my younger brother Ibrahim. I was like, what do you think? He goes, oh man, huh? they're living double lives. They're spiritually dead and empty. And that which will save you from this kind of condition is for you to learn your religion. While you see a Talib Ilm in Al Medina, he's living on what? $200 a month and he's the happiest man in the world. The way your heart has been created, it craves for its creator. Right? We're spending huh, 15 hours a day on our phones trying to what? Cover the underlining issues, the spiritual emptiness. By what? Surfing the internet. But we are dead. And that which is going to bring us to life is none other than Al-Ilm. Beneficial knowledge, brothers and sisters. Which comes with a feeling that you cannot put into words. Jazakum Allah khairan. I took a lot of... I went over by six minutes. May Allah bless you all. Honestly, brothers, I say this from the bottom of my heart. To see all of these young faces in the... I was going to say masjid, but we're in a sports hall, which is inside of the masjid building. Right? To see all of these young faces, wallahi, wanting to listen, it really, really shows that there is goodness in every single one of your hearts. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. The fact that you gave up and sacrificed your Saturday afternoon, it really shows that there's goodness in you. May Allah bless you all. Right? I ask Allah Azza wa Jal, if He doesn't reunite us in this world, to reunite us in the hereafter. Right? May Allah bless you all, man. I, I used to hear a lot that, and I'm sure, our brother Muhammad was on a trip here to the US would agree as well. We are made to feel in the, in, the, in the UK that everybody in America is off. Everyone there is liberal. Everyone there is feminist. Everyone there is this and is that. I was not expecting turnouts like this. And you guys see what happened in Minnesota, right? May Allah help them. Huh? Huh? <laughs> to see all of these. Yeah, the fact that they turned up Honestly, it shows that there's goodness in them as well, right? Honestly, I need to go back to these British people that talk bad about America and put them in their lane. Don't want to do that for you guys. May Allah bless you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.